Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the final virtual author visit of the summer. This, meet, this visit is brought to you by a new collaboration between Caldwell, Ridgefield, West Caldwell, and West Orange Public Libraries right here in New Jersey. All participants will be muted during the presentation. Please type your questions into the chat and we will answer as many questions as we can after the presentation. Thank you, Patrick Oliver, founder of Say It Loud, for making this evening possible. Our esteemed guest emulates qualities of African-American women who earned the title Brave Black First, including Michelle Obama, Ruby D, Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi. Brave Black First, 50 plus African-American women who changed the world is a collaboration between the National Museum of African-American History, one of the Smithsonian's 19 museums, illustrator Erin K. Robinson, and our guest and author, Cheryl Willis Hudson. With carefully selected words, Ms. Hudson recounts the contributions of over 50 women, including Condoleezza Rice, Carla Hayden, and the High Priestess of Soul, Nina Simone. She captures the spirit of empowerment exquisitely. In 1987, Cheryl, Cheryl Willis Hudson co-founded the independent press Just Us Books, located right here in West Orange, New Jersey. Cheryl and co-founder Wade Hudson launched the company that for over 30 years has focused on black interest books for youth. While running all aspects of their publishing company, the Hudsons continued to write and edit books, not only for Just Us Books, but for mainstream publishing houses, including Penguin Random House and Candlewick Press. Cheryl Willis Hudson and Wade Hudson's latest anthology, The Talk, documents real families' discussions about race and identity. A dedicated author, editorial director, diversity consultant, quilter, a cappella singer, publisher, and public speaker. Please give a clap emoji and help me welcome Cheryl Willis Hudson. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Olga. Um, I'm delighted to be here today um, to do one of the first book club uh, chats and um, uh, on two books that we recently had a part in playing. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is Brave Black First. And um, you will see that on the screen. I'm really sharing the story of, of two books that are, are related in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a real way. Um, some of the authors, some of the artists who are portrayed in Brave Black First have made significant contributions to the world of music, art, um, literature. And one that we're going to talk about, if we can go to the next slide, is, those are the two books you see, the next slide, is Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells said that the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. She's one of the uh, personalities, and I would say personalities because she was a firebrand. She was a, a journalist, she was a, a writer, she was um, a surrogate mother to her brothers and sisters. Um, she raised them, she was an educator, uh, she went to Russ College, she also went to Fisk, and she was a, a major mover and shaker uh, before in, in the 19th century, at the turn of the century, one of the founders of the NAACP as a part of the Niagara movement. So in this book, and we'll move on to the next slide, you will see, and there are three people that are I'd like to, to talk about. Shirley Chisholm is one. Obviously, she was the first, the first African-American woman to run for president of the United States. Michelle Obama was the first African-American first lady. And then Ida B. Wells, who had so much to do with 
um, the suffrage movement and really trying to guarantee getting the right to vote, vote and then guaranteeing that right to vote. She um, wrote about uh, lynching um, being involved in her community and actually being run out of her community because she was such a militant using her voice to speak for her people. Next slide. The 19th Amendment was passed uh, August 18, 2020. So we've, uh, I'm sorry, 1920. So we are observing the 100th anniversary uh, of that legislation. And you will see all kinds of things about women getting the vote. But one of the major things about that era was that Black women uh, were not enfranchised. Black women were left out of that discussion. As a matter of fact, uh, Ida B. Wells had organized a group of women in Chicago, Black women who were in favor of suffrage. And when a march was held in Washington, D.C., uh, Ida B. Wells was told that she could not march with the white women. So there was a split in that movement. And obviously, um, Black people weren't given the right to vote even after suffrage and until 1965. So I'd like to read a little bit about uh, Ida B. Wells. And I can't find the page number, <laughs> but I will get to that in just a second. Ida B. Wells. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Ida B. Wells was born July 16th 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi, and she died March 25th, 1931 in Chicago, Illinois. Ida B. Wells was an American investigative journalist, feminist, and militant activist who for decades led an anti-lynching crusade in the United States. Ida was also a fiery public speaker, a community organizer, and an advocate for social justice. She traveled throughout the South, gathering data about lynchings, and eventually published the statistics in her 1895 pamphlet called A Red Record. Ida was born into slavery in 1862. Her parents, James and Lizzie Wells, were active in local Republican politics during the period of Reconstruction and Ida attended Rust University, a school for newly freed slaves, where her father served on the board of trustees. The oldest of seven siblings, she dropped out of school to raise the others. This gives you just an idea of the flavor of the biographies in this text. What we wanted to do, and uh, the illustrations are really uh, gorgeous, done by Aaron, K. Robinson in conjunction uh, with the Smithsonian. Uh, making a book is uh, not a, a, an easy thing to do. There's a lot of research involved in it. And I was just very fortunate in being asked to write the text and also having the opportunity to go to the National Museum of African American History and Culture and see pamphlets that were written by Ida B. Wells, uh, see the clothing of um, women who are portrayed in this book. So when you look at the book, you will see a picture of Ida B. Wells, but behind that, and in each case of every one of the 50 women who's portrayed in this book, there's some object, some pamphlet, some photograph, some memorabilia of these women. Uh, Shirley Chisholm's campaign materials uh, from 1972, um, photographs of uh, Ruby Bridges, uh, who at the age of six years old was an activist. And I was extremely fortunate in putting this book together in the fact that actually my husband and I, Wade, had met Ruby Bridges um, maybe 15 years ago when her book was being published by Scholastic. Um, people will know Ruby Bridges uh, by this illustration, but they'll also know her by a famous portrait that was done by Norman Rockwell. 
Ruby Bridges. Kids don't know anything about racism. They're taught that by adults. When Ruby Bridges walks up the steps of William France Elementary School on her first day of school, she had to pass through a mob of protesting, screaming adults. It was November 14th, 1960, and these hateful whites didn't want a six-year-old black child attending school with their children. To protect her, four United States Marshals escorted Ruby to class. Legendary artist Norman Rockwell commemorated Ruby's experience in his famous painting, The Problem We All Live With. That image, however, did not really capture the full scale of the trauma that Ruby experienced. So that gives you kind of an idea of, um, from the, I guess from the first paragraph, I attempted to capture the spirit of why these women were first, why they were brave, and obviously they were, were Black. If we look a little bit further in the next slide, We'll see Ruby, uh, I'm sorry, we'll see Ida B. Wells again. Um, black people are not one dimensional. And in many cases, when uh, African Americans are portrayed, or in the past, African Americans were portrayed in literature, there may be one line about one thing that that person did. Uh, all of the women are not marginalized. Um, Ida B. Wells was able to have a family, she was an author, she was an educator, she was a publisher, she was an activist. She sued um, uh, the local freight, freight car, I'm sorry, trolley car, when she was uh, told to sit in, uh, out away from the white passengers, she sued for her right to uh, maintain her, her seat. And she won the case, uh, but she never got the, the settlement of the money for the case and was discouraged by that treatment, and this was in the early, uh, actually it was in the 1800s, but she continued her protests and her activism on through the 30s. Next slide. So Ida B. Wells, she was an activist, she was a journalist, she did a lot of things to raise her voice. And in the publishing uh, community, what Wade and I have done with Just Us Books is we function both as uh, authors, and also as editors. We put together recently a, a volume called The Talk, and we are here for The Talk. We edit it together, and this is a, a book for middle readers, conversations about race, love, and truth. Ida B. Wells could have written something <laughs> for this collection. Uh, it's a multicultural collection of 17 essays, letters, uh, illustrations, lists, uh, poems that all speak to the idea of having a talk. Uh, traditionally, African-American parents have had to have this talk with their kids about how to walk, how to talk, how to behave, what to do if you run into the police or the police run into you. Um, and it's a traditional kind of coming of age um, conversation that unfortunately Black parents have always had to have uh, with their kids. Our parents had them with us uh, growing up in Jim Crow segregated South. Uh, we had them with our children who are now adults and parents are still having these conversations. Um, very recently, there's been a, a huge movement um, that has, I can't even say it's sprung up, but it's evolved out of the, the murder of George Floyd. And what this incident ha has done is brought to light um, how uh, Black people have been marginalized and, and brutalized um, by the police and how systemic racism affects our lives. And because it was recorded and um, made available for so many people to see, it, there was as a, an enormous upcry uh, about it in terms of what what's the truth about racism? I mean, your systemic racism does exist. So this collection is really a, a series of conversation, conversation, conversation starters. It's not a how-to book, but it relates the talks that a number of parents 
have with their children, whether it's about police brutality or body image or self-esteem or uh, getting along with friends or, or religious freedom. So the next slide will show the 30 contributors of the talk as a curator of the art and the passages uh, in this collection. Uh, Wade and I uh, invited a number of our friends and people that we had published, people that we admired and had respect for in the kid lit community to join in their conversations. Um, I won't name all of them, they're listed here, but there are 30 contributors in addition to uh, Wade and myself. Next slide. One of the unique things about uh, the talk is that, uh, again, it's for middle readers and we consider this uh, age group from nine to 12 year olds. They're short essays um, and poems, but they uh, are on a variety of subjects. These are uh, slides will show three of the uh, entries. One is uh, Never Be Afraid to Soar by Valerie Wilson Wesley, author and the illustrator is Don Tate. The second panel at the top is a question raised by Duncan Tonotia, who is Mexican American. And the title of his piece is Why Are There Racist People? Um, the third one is a story that takes place in the future written by Adam Gidwitz and illustrated by Peter H. Reynolds and it's called Our Inheritance. Uh, Valerie Wilson Wesley's father was uh, a Tuskegee Airman and in her story she relates a letter to her grandson um, really encouraging him never be, to be afraid to soar. Uh, rather than read all of it, I want you to just take a quick look at uh, the artwork because there's so many uh, kids pretend to and want to be superheroes. Um, but uh, Bertrand Wilson was a hero. He, uh, as a Tuskegee Airman, he was a great pilot. He won the Distinguished Flying Cross in uh, World War II. And people have heard about the Tuskegee Airmen. But in this letter, uh, Valerie writes to her grandson um, uh, an incident in which she and her father were stopped by a policeman uh, because they were driving in a nice luxury car that her father owned. Um, but the policeman intimidated her father. Uh, and this letter is just uh, really a kind of history of how her father had to endure a certain kind of humiliation for no reason. This took place uh, in the 50s, but it's still taking place now. Uh, Duncan Tonotia has beautiful illustrations that are based on traditional Mexican iconography. And you will see here and, and, a, and a wonderful spread that he wrote and illustrated. He went to a school and part of what we do as authors is to have school visits and read our books uh, sometimes in person and hopefully soon again we'll be able to, to do that. And one of the questions that was asked by um, one of the students is why, why are people racist? And what Duncan tried to do is to really examine the, that question for himself so that he could answer the student. In Adam Gidwitz's uh, piece, Our Inheritance, he talks about white privilege and how that's a talk that needs to be had with white people and black people. So this whole idea of the talk is not something that's solely the responsibility of black Americans, but all of us have that responsibility. Next slide. There are uh, two, three other pieces that I'd just like to show because the artwork again is so wonderful. Meg Medina is a Newbery uh, winner, uh, what, writes some wonderful pieces, uh, is a, a Cuban American and uh, Rudy Gutierrez illustrated their piece, which is called Habla and how they're 
seems to be in some cases uh, discrimination against people who speak a different language or have a different accent. And her piece is really a love letter to her daughter explaining why, uh, you know, you can say words in both languages and they can still convey love and, and meaning. And if someone says, don't speak English, that's not the right language, um, that's an affront. That is discounting uh, your value as a person. So all of these essays are done in really such a loving way. Grace Lynn uh, writes a piece to her daughter uh, called You Are Not a China Doll. A lot of times uh, in our culture, there are words and images that are stereotypical and they are offensive to groups of people. She explains to her daughter um, that someone calling her a China doll is not uh, uh, a wonderful thing. It's not a term of endearment. Um, it indicates that people are looking at Asians sometimes as, as objects, or objectifying them. So language carries uh, elements of racism and stereotype behavior. The final illustration there is 10. This is written by Tracy Batiste and illustrated by April Harrison. And it's a wonderful piece, uh, noting uh, 10 steps to making your way through a confrontation if you are stopped by uh, a policeman. And the main one, the 10th one, is to remember, um, you can see in the illustration there, your hands on the dashboard. And it's taken from the point of view uh, a, a mother talking to the child who is also in the car. So again, these are conversation starters, but this is literature in the sense that one can read these stories, put yourself in the position or the place of the writer, the illustrator, the character in the story, and be empathetic. And hopefully there will be more understanding and more revelations about why there are things that are um, problematic in a society that is really plagued with, with racism and injustice for a number of people. Next slide. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Um, Ida B. Wells' words really ring true. They rang true in the 1800s. They rang true in 1909 when she organized Black women in Chicago to get the right to vote, and later when she helped to form the NAACP and uh, exposing um, all kinds of statistics about uh, lynching at the turn of the century, all the way through the Second World War, uh, first, I'm sorry, First World War, and into the 30s. Uh, she is a, a major figure in the suffrage uh, movement. Next slide. So there we have the talk. So let's, let's talk. I've, I've done a, a bit of talking and um, I'm sure there may be questions uh, about um, the content of the book or how we put the book together um, or anything that you'd like to, to ask about uh, this whole process. And if we turn to the next slide, you will see Wade and myself uh, in our offices here in, in West Orange. Um, you can reach us through our publishing company and we encourage you to, to, to visit justicebooks.com. And you can also post questions um, there, post questions online on Facebook and use the hashtag Let's Talk Book. So I'm gonna turn it over to Olga and Jane and our audience and people who have questions. And thank you so much for uh, listening to part of what uh, I do as an author and as an editor and publisher. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hudson. Um, I think Jane is monitoring the chat. Let me see if, can you see the chat if I, oh, no. Yes, do I do. So I do, okay. we have a couple questions. Tell us about how the Smithsonian was involved with your project. Uh, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, the Sm Smithsonian is a, a huge institution. They have a publishing 
program, and they have published a series of books um, with uh, Crown Books for Young Readers. Uh, my publisher, my editor there is Phoebe Ye, and there are actually four books, I think, in the series uh, on Black women. Uh, mine was the first. So I was asked to, to write a, a book that would relate to um, women who were portrayed and um, who had memorabilia in the museum. So it was a, a real fun project to do because I was asked to do it. I had uh, edited several other books and biographies on Black women, and I had done a, a, a book for another educational publisher on um, members of the Harlem Renaissance. So I, I think that was how I was selected because I had done some work before. So that, I mean, it's, it's great. It's great institution. They have all of the resources and information. Um, we visited there three times, met with the author there. And also that one feature of the book, you may be able to see this. I don't know if the, if the screen comes, the screen share comes down, I could probably make this bigger. There's, there's an appendix uh, at the back of the book and the information there uh, will we'll give you resources, photographs um, about uh, Leontine Price. That was just a page. Uh, Marian Anderson's dress that she uh, wore when she sung on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, the dress that was uh, designed by Ann Lau and worn by Jackie Kennedy is in the museum. Ann Lau is one of the one of the women who's profiled here. So this was just a dream job because I love to do research and that was good. Fascinating. So we have another question. How do you select the topics to cover in the book, the talk? Um, we, we actually had a proposal that was written and um, coming out of, we had done another book called We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices, which was uh, a, an anthology of 50 contributors that was published in 2018. Uh, that was a collection that um, asked the question, what shall we tell the children? There was so much divisive uh, rhetoric, conversation, uh, memes, trolls, all kinds of things happening after the election in 2016. And we wondered, you know, what, what are you gonna tell children about the things that are going on about people are saying, what can you say um, to them? So that was a call to action. And that was a question that was asked about, um, we rise, we resist, we raise our voices. But after that book was published and almost immediately after, we knew that there had to be more conversations uh, about talking to kids about race, about love, about truth, how to encourage them, uh, to let them know that writers, authors, lots of other people are here saying encouraging things rather than negative things. So the call to action really was an invitation to 15 authors really to write about their experiences or what they had seen. So we didn't tell the contributors what to write. We just said, we have to have this talk. This is the kind of conversation that we have had with our kids about how to successfully navigate yourself in a world that may be very racist, but also to give you uh, the tools for, for doing so with self-esteem and um, a knowledge of, of yourself. So each person who wrote an essay here, uh, Selena Alco um, has a biracial child. She wrote about talking to her son about her, their, her, his dual heritage and, and some, the sometimes anger that he felt and the discrimination that he felt. Tracy Baptiste uh, wrote about how to navigate. Actually, the story that she wrote was uh, based on true life incident with her and her daughter. It wasn't her son. Uh, she, and her, she and her daughter were stopped by a policeman uh, for no reason, no real reason. Uh, so these are real life incidents and people brought their own experiences to the talk. 
And I just want to mention one thing. You mentioned we rise, um, we, we rise, we resist, we raise our voices. Can you speak a little bit about your niece and how the idea for the book came about? Well, actually, that, that's a story that uh, I love to hear Wade tell. Our niece, oh, okay. uh, Grant, but uh, he, he's, he's not on screen now, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll speak for him and share that story. Our niece, uh, Jordan, was about six years old, going on seven when uh, in 2016 and the night of the election a lot of people were very disappointed <laughs> by the results of uh, the election because the then candidate uh, 45 became 45th president uh, had said so many divisive things about minorities about people who were disabled about um, women just it, terrible things. And as a child, hearing the news and hearing things going on, she was uh, inc inconsolable when she heard you. What are we going to do now with somebody like that in, in the White House? And um, that, my niece put that on Facebook and Wade responded to it and said, if, if Jordan is feeling this way and she's seven years old, what are other children uh, feeling? How are they respond? And what can you tell children? So that was the impetus for starting that conversation, what shall we tell them, was the question that was asked of the contributors. So uh, we have to credit her always. Thank you. And just to let everyone know, that book has won an honor of the Jane Addams Book Award, which is an award given for peace. So congratulations on that. Jane, are you ready for the next question? Sure, yes. Um, thank you for all these wonderful questions, everyone. Great to think about. So considering the over 50 women who are featured in your book, do you have any favorites? Who among them do you consider you identify with closely? That's a hard question. I, I love Ruby Bridges because she was a kid and, and because I had an opportunity to meet her actually several times um, um, some years ago. And she's a wonderful, wonderful person who has continued to give back to her community in, in New Orleans. Uh, it's hard. I love Fannie Lou Hamer. I love Wilma Rudolph. Um, Michelle Obama uh, had an opportunity not to meet her in person, but to get real close when she spoke at the um, American Library Association um, meeting two years ago. And we shared the same publisher. Um, she's in the, in the adult division of Crown and, and we are in the uh, young, young, younger uh, division of Crown. So it's, it's hard. Um, Faith Ringel is, she's kick, I mean, she's a, She's a kicker. She's a wonderful uh, artist. Uh, she's a quilter, and I, I love quilts. So again, had an opportunity. Uh, it's, it's wonderful when you can meet someone um, firsthand. And, and it, you see people in books, and, and you know that they, they exist, and they are doing things. But these are a real, everyday, real live people. And uh, she's a marvelous uh, artist and an activist. Um, so um, those are a couple of favorites. Interesting. So another question, what has been the responses you've received from young readers? Uh, for all of our books, they've really actually been very, very positive. Uh, my, my grand, this is my grandniece, Jordan, Actually, she just did a book report on the talk. We got an email from her, her mom, uh, and she had, that was one of her first assignments. Uh, she, she goes to school in North Carolina, and that was one of her assignments. So we've heard, we get uh, mail, sometimes through the publisher and sometimes uh, directly, but the, the response has been, been really good. Oh, that's great, yeah. Good book report. Um, so what are you working on now? What's your next project that we can look for? Ah, uh, um, we are working on uh, uh, another anthology, um, which we can't really talk about uh, yet, but it's, it's for middle uh, readers. 
Uh, Wade is working on a, a memoir about his life growing up in the South. Uh, I'm just, I'm thinking about things. I'm thinking about things. Um, just as books, as a publisher, we have two new picture books that will be coming out, one in the spring of 2021, a wonderful, wonderful picture book by the poet uh, Marilyn Nelson. And it's illustrated by Wayne Anthony Still, a beautiful historical uh, story about her family growing up in an all black town uh, in Bowley, Oklahoma, which is not too far from Tulsa. So we're really excited about that as a, a new title. So look for that. Wow, that sounds fantastic. We will be on the lookout. Uh, so another question, what is it like to work as an editor and bring together so many talents and different voices into one work? Um, I love it. Um, we love it. Um, Wade and I work together in terms of coming up with suggestions for um, authors and illustrators who are included. And so the, when you're working with, and m m all of the authors are, are fantastic. All of them are, are award winners. Um, their work is, is known and you probably have their works in your library. Meg Medina, again, is a Caldecott uh, uh, Newbery Honor winner, uh, Kwame Alexander, uh, Nikki Grimes, Adam Gibwitz. All of the people that we have asked are such wonderful creatives that it's a joy working with them. I, I'd hate to say that I don't have a lot of editing to do, but editing is copy editing or maybe a turn of a phrase, or would you like to phrase this a little bit differently? Or can you expand on this idea? Um, so that's fun. It's a kind of a, a guidance uh, rather than, you know, you can't rewrite. Who can rewrite the words of uh, Christopher Myers? Uh, you know, how can I, how could I, do anything better with what Renee Watson has to say. Um, so, I mean, but that's the joy of working with uh, writers who are experienced and have been through the process with their own editors. The, the challenge then is putting them together in a cohesive package, the collection. And that's where CBA, who is our executive editor and publisher at Crown, uh, comes into the picture. Wade and I have a, an idea of who we want to be involved in the, the story, who we want to illustrate, which selection, uh, but it reaches the hands of, of CBA who says, okay, well, maybe we can start out with a selection by uh, Renee Watson and end with the selection by Chris Myers because of the content. And then we the, the puzzle, the pieces come together by working together and going back and forth with both the editor and also with the art director, the designer, the production people. So it's a joint process. That's fascinating. I know Miss Olga had a, a few other questions she was wanting to ask. So I was wondering, you talked a little bit about editing and you almost, almost answered my question about research. Can you speak a little bit about the process of gathering the research and choosing the words or the facts that you include? How does that work? Um, I generally start with um, uh, a, a kind of an outline. We, you know that you want in um, a biography, you want uh, names, dates, locations, when, where, how, uh, when people were born, uh, when they died, what they did, what was the major part of their career, what was a key um, incident in their life, and in particular for middle readers, what I hope to capture was um, a, a, a moment in time when Aretha Franklin sat down at the piano and, and played for President Obama. What was that like? 
I had seen that on TV <laughs> on the Kennedy Awards. So I knew that had to go in the book because that was a key moment that she had gotten uh, the presidential uh, award of, of Medal of, of Freedom. So um, that was a key event and you kind of hone in on it. But doing the research means that you go to um, sources online uh, at the library, um, magazine articles, listen to records, remembering uh, my days admiring Aretha Franklin when I was a youngster. Um, so the research has to be fact-checked. That's done after you've written and provide, you have to provide sources uh, and usually three sources to validate uh, a name, a date, or a spelling. Uh, and then the copy editing department at Crown, which is part of Random House, uh, does fact checking as well. Uh, in Brave Black First, the Smithsonian checked the facts <laughs> as, as well. Um, and if there was something that was not correct, uh, it had to be corrected before it went to press. So it's a process. Once you do the creative work of putting that biography together, it definitely has to be fact checked. Most of the research is done online. Thank you. And you're being too modest to yourself because your work chooses the proper words perfectly. And the, your biographies are really approachable to middle readers and also for adults like me who have short attention spans. <laughs> it's kind of hard to get a, a lot of information in a biography in 400 words. Uh, and I think that was the word count. Um, so you've got to be selective. And that's why it was so important for this particular book to have more facts um, in, in the index, uh, what's called the index. And actually, um, in addition to the facts that are provided in the book, if you go to my website and click on the book, there are additional sources because we just couldn't, and we, we didn't want to, in this particular book, you know, it's, it's not a scholarly work, it's a very readable work. So we didn't want to use footnotes on the page, um, but there are other sources to back up the information uh, on my website. Thank you. Does anyone have any other contributions or comments or questions for Ms. Hudson? Okay. I want to thank you. Ms. Hudson. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Wade. Thank you, Katura, and all the staff at Just Us Books. It's been a magical experience having you end our summer with us. And since we know you're up the street, we hope to see you soon. Thank <laughs> you, you for coming. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. I, and thank you for all of the, the the visitors there who and the participants in the chat room, I see that there are questions there that, and I know that this will be made available um, as a recording. I, we, we just go to West Orange Library to find out where that will be. So correct, it will be on our YouTube channel as well as the, um, we'll do a post on Facebook to promote it and also on, of course, our website as a resource under the children's tab. And I just want to say one more thing. I, I love librarians. They're some of my <laughs> favorite people. And I see one of my favorite librarians there, Sasha Orange, in, in, in three different spots on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for in, inviting me. Thank you for uh, providing this service for your book club and for um, patrons of the West Orange Library. It's a great place and it's so welcoming there. So we're happy to be neighbors. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.